Hey guys, Dr. Justin Marcajani here. Today we're going to be talking about the leaky gut acne skin connection today. We're going to be diving in. Is there a connection? What can you do about it? What are some things we can do to fix our gut, fix our skin topically, internally? What's the root cause? We're going to dive into those questions here today in just a minute. Before we do, please smash that like button. Put, give me a thumbs up. Make sure you hit the bell so you get notifications coming your way. And I'd love to see your comments down below. We'll be definitely answering some of those. So first off, here's my agenda for today out of the gate. So we'll be looking at the gut brain access. What is it? How does it impact acne? We'll be looking at probiotics and their impact on the skin, uh, underlying causes of acne, uh, nutrient support, and as well as lab testing as well. So we're going to dive into those things here in just a minute. All right. So off the bat here, let's go into the gut brain access or the gut skin brain access if you will so we have acne this is a manifestation of bacteria on the skin typically the cutie bacterium acnes it's kind of a funny uh little bacterial name but cutie bacterium acnes plural the condition is acne vulgaris we just hear it as acne right but in general it's bacteria inhabiting typically combination of staph and cutie bacterium acne uh, just in the epidermis or just down below into the pilo and that hair shaft area creating inflammation and then creating a cyst or whitehead etc everyone knows what acne looks like and feels like so you can see here there's a connection with the hpa access the autonomic nervous system that's your body's ability to interpret and deal with stress think of the adrenal glands think of cortisol think of adrenaline of course stress and high glycemic foods low levels of beneficial bacteria low fiber Again, things that are going to be more processed, more sugar, more acellular carbs, these are going to have a major impact on dysbiotic bacteria. It's going to feed a lot of your bad bugs. You're not going to have a lot of good fiber, so you're not going to feed a lot of the good bacteria either. And it's going to be high glycemic. So that means it's going to feed the bugs, but it's also going to stimulate more insulin. We'll talk about what insulin is doing to your skin. It has a major impact on the microvilli and the absorption of nutrients. And of course, if we have gut permeability, some of that bacteria, some of that LPS could make its way into the bloodstream and then potentially influence the skin and create more of a bacterial imbalance on the skin unless you have your acne um, skin infection. Now, one study I want to hit up here with you guys is to kind of hi you know, highlight things from a high level. So here's your skin right here. So you see the little red here, that's your staph, um, staph epidermitis, and then you have the cutie bacterium acnes in purple. And then you can see they can go into the little hair shaft here, just below the skin. And then you can have neutrophil and T-cell activation based on a lot of these things. You can get sebaceous gland cysts as well. Big cysts can go in there, and that can create problems. Okay, that's kind of the, the high-level overview there. Now, this is a really interesting study. Okay, this is looking at, actually, this is a better one to start with. Let's go right to the top. So potential role of microbiome in acne. This is a comprehensive review. So we look at cutie bacterium acnes, and it's looking at it from a whole different underlying cause of, of why these things are happening. Now, first off, I'm going to hit one thing out of the gate. So there's a bunch of dermatologists from the 1920s, which is really, really interesting. I'm going to find this. Where did it go here? Uh, is it here? Let's see here. It was a 2011. Here you go. Right here. So acne bulgaris, probiotics, and the gut-brain skin access. So really interesting. There was these two dermatologists from the 1920s, Stokes and Pillsbury, and they hypothesized that there was this connection between depression and anxiety in the skin. And they were using lactobacillus, probiotic cultures, and even cod liver oil back in the 1920s to have a major impact on skin. They found that probiotics had a major influence on reducing skin inflammation, helping with oxidative stress. Really interesting. We knew a lot of these things like almost over 100 years ago, right? So we've actually gotten further away from getting to the root cause of skin issues uh, 100 years later. It's kind of crazy, right? Today's modern day approach is main, mainly rubbing on, let's say, um, topical antibiotics or using some kind of a retin-A, vitamin A analog, or maybe using like some kind of a tretinoin or um, some kind of a hydrocortisone or immunosuppressant, right? Or burning or cutting it off. We really haven't gotten you know, for the most part, to getting the underlying cause of what's happening. So, intestinal microflora plays a major role. Diet plays a major role. So, if you go to this study, there's a couple of things that are really interesting. Uh, out of the gate, they saw that abdominal bloating was present in 37% of people associated with acne. 37%. Huge. So, we know there's a strong gut connection. They also found achlorhydria, low stomach acid, was also present with a lot of patients that have acne, right? So, low stomach acid. Many as 40% of those with acne have hypochlorhydria. That's low stomach acid. Also found that um, probiotics and omega-3s were low in a lot of these patients, and they were utilizing them and supplementing them, and they saw improvements. They saw a lot of 
other issues. There was emotional connection issues, worry, anxiety. Again, this could potentially be caused by the gut dysfunction, thus causing the skin issues, like I showed in that gut brain or gut brain skin axis. So really interesting out of the gate. They were using lactobacillus back then, which is really interesting, and also using cod liver oil. So when we look at the skin, it's very important that we try to get to the root cause of, of, of why these things are happening. Now, back to my big picture here, probiotics have a major impact on the skin. They reduce inflammation. One, they have an anti-inflammatory impact in the gut directly. They're going to reduce inflammation in the gut. Obviously, we try to figure out why probiotics are low to begin with. Are we eating a bunch of processed carbs and junk and that's creating this dysbiotic overgrowth and that's kind of crowding out the beneficial bacteria? Do we have like the Pillsbury and Stokes review article showed low stomach acid, low omega-3s? That could be impacting the microbiome. Maybe we're not getting exposure to probiotics in our food. Maybe that's a thing, right? So it's a lot of different, you know, variables. So we have to have, you know, some fiber from good, healthy whole foods and vegetables and fruits, and ideally good, healthy fats and proteins because those are going to have good omega-3 fatty acids in them. Proteins are going to be important, right? Now, insulin's a big important thing too. So we have insulin from processed carbs and sugars. We have good, healthy fatty acids from protein sources, especially omega-3 fish and grass-fed meat are going to have a lot of omega-3s. And then we want to avoid a lot of the junky processed carbs that are going to be driving the dysbiotic bacteria, they're going to be increasing the ins insulin. And of course, these processed foods tend to decrease probiotic levels. All right, so that's a big thing out of the gate. Now, the underlying cause of acne, so you're going to have this cutie bacterium acne bacterial overgrowth. Now, you're, that's going to be driving it. You're going to do that internally. Also, you can have it externally. Now, why do you have it externally? Well, it's probably because of the gut, right? Insulin's going to be a big driver too because insulin's going to cause sebum secretion. Increased sebum is going to fuel. It's going to get into the pores and it will be fuel for the cutie bacterium acne on the skin. And so if you eat more insulinogenic foods, processed foods, carbs, grains, the more processed, the higher glycemic it is, the more of an insulin response you get. That provides the fuel for the cutie bacterium acne to eat it. And that can create inflammation on the skin because you're providing the fuel. So ideally we address it internally, right? With the food changes, with the diet changes. But Having a good topical routine will help because you will lower some of the bacterial count. The problem with a lot of the topical things is they can be very irritating. They can disrupt the skin microbiome and they can maybe cause redness and overly dry you out. Now, I'll talk about the specific strategies and the cleansers that I use. I'll provide links down below. Keep it really simple. You can go high level. You can keep it simple. Um, you, you, I mean, you can have more expensive things or cheaper things. I'll kind of give you options of what I like personally. So you want to address the gut. Stress response matters. That autonomic nervous system and cortisol and adrenaline, that can also cause an internal production of glucose too. So you want to make sure you hit that side as well. A lot of adrenal issues that can surge cortisol, which then mobilizes glucose. Even though you're not eating it, you could still be surging it due to stress. Now, the nutrient support for acne, vitamin A is going to be important. If we have a lot of acne, a lot of um, you know potential scarring, we may do a, a vitamin A supplement outside of like a whole food source, like a cod liver oil. You know, in the conventional medicine world, they're going to throw, um, not ret well, they could do some topical retin-A, but it's Accutane is a, it's a synthetic type of vitamin A. I mean, it's got the, the black box warning for birth defects. It can be teratogenic, but that can decrease oil production in the skin. That is a possibility. Again, I'd much rather use vitamin A and just do one to two tablespoons of a really good cod liver oil source, usually you're going to get about 100% of the RDA within one tablespoon. So if you're at one to two, that's a pretty good whack of vitamin A. You throw in some grass-fed liver or some grass-fed beef and some high-quality fish, that gives you a good bump. If you're still having acne, we may want to give you a vitamin A in a liquid form, like a retin, retinol drop, and then take that, and that will improve vitamin A and get you up to maybe a higher level. But you just got to make sure if you're a female that you're really being careful about uh, pregnancy and things like that because you can be teratogenic. That means birth defects if you're going super high. You don't have to worry about it with the cod liver oil, but if you're going a higher type of retinol, you know, 70, 80, 90,000 IUs, that could be an issue. Again, do not do that unless you're working with a functional medicine doctor on that front. But in general, vitamin A, cod liver oil, probiotics can be helpful. If you have a lot of dysbiotic bacteria, throwing probiotics in there could cause more bloating, could cause more gas because you're just throwing a whole bunch of seeds in a weeded, uh, a garden full of weeds and that's not going to create a uh, lasting impact. So you want to do a lot of the de-weeding first, then throw the, seed, the seeds and the beneficial seeds in second. So that's 
kind of we clean out some of the bugs, add in the probiotics and the beneficial seeds, sec it with the fertilizer. That's where the prebiotic fibers will come into play. So it depends. If you're one of those people that you get bloated or gassy or brain foggy with adding probiotics in, then you definitely want to be careful of adding in the seeds too soon. Um, and then, of course, we may add in other types of nutrients like collagen peptides, extra omega-3s or cod liver oil, we add in some high-quality liver glandular support, and then we may add in some topical things as well to help. Now, the big topical things I love to do, I like a high-quality sulfur soap. It's unscented. I like ones that are have a little bit of salicylic acid in there, gentle, like 2% or so. That's gonna Sulfur soap has been around forever. One article on it here. Been around for like 100 years. And it comes from typically volcanic lava, or I should say lava, volcanic ash type of soil, for instance. One article here, right? The use of sulfur soap in dermatology, right? Interesting. Sulfur alone using combination has demonstrated efficacy in the treatment of many dermatological conditions, right? It's antifungal, antibacterial. It's uh, keratolytic, so this will help with um, keratosis pilaris. If you're a female, you get the chicken skin on the back of your arms. It'll break up the keratin stuck in the pores. So really helpful. Help with rosacea, subarate dermatitis, dandruff, pityriasis, versicolor, scabies, warts. So very helpful. I like it a lot. Um, very beneficial out of the gate. So I'll use a 10% sulfur soap. Just rub it in. Get it on your face like this. Just get it on and then let it rinse off. Again, it can be a little bit drying, so start with a few seconds. Get it on. Let it rinse off. Add five seconds each day. See where you sit. I find it very helpful. I use it daily. It's a wonderful job. I'll combine that with a really good witch hazel based toner. Make sure it's alcohol free. Make sure it's a nice toner that's designed for that. It's not like witch hazel for like bug bites. Make sure it's a toner. Do an unscented or an aloe, one that's gentle. Rub that on afterwards. That kind of gets the pH, tightens the pores up, provides a nice gentle antimicrobial environment, enough where it could maybe knock down the cured bacterium acnes and any of the staph stuff, but not enough where it's not be overly drying, overly taxing on the skin. So you want some mild antibacterial, get the pH dialed in benefits, but you don't want to overly dry it out. Like you see a lot of these kids using excess benzoyl peroxide, and it can be very drying. Benzoyl peroxide is shown to be very helpful against cured bacterium acnes, but I would use it more as a spot treatment, as a band-aid treatment, not as a root cause kind of support protocol, if you will. So we do the, the sulfur soap, a nice witch hazel-based toner, alcohol-free, and then I'm a big fan of using high-quality emu oil. If you look at the comedogenic scale of one to five, comedogenic means of clogging qualities, right? The clogging qualities of the oil, you're going to see it's at a one. It's very, very low. And it's also used in burn victim units in hospitals throughout the country. It's very powerful, very anti-inflammatory, a lot of vitamin K. So two, three pumps on that after everything's dried, moisturize everything in, and that provides good moisture. The skin needs moisture. If the skin does not get enough moisture, it will produce excess oils, and those oils can then potentially cause more problems. So you want to Allow that moisture in without your skin having to produce the oils. Get that good, high-quality emu oil in there. There's some other product lines that are, are excellent, really, really good. There's two products I like called Lipid Barrier um, Serum, or it should Barrier Restore Serum and Lipid Barrier Complex. Barrier Restore Serum and Lipid Barrier Complex. I'll put links down below for those. Those are a little more pricey, but I'm starting off with the simple stuff, and then you guys can go up from there. Uh, those have like different ceramides in there and cholesterol and good fatty acids for your skin as well. And if you, you know, if your skin's really sensitive, you can always go to like a CeraVe or a Cetaphil, like non-comedogenic, like really hypoallergenic sensitive skin um, type of moisturizer too. Moisturizer plays a big role as well. And just be careful with too much, uh, too much sunlight, too much UV, right? Y you don't want to burn. That's a really key thing for overall skin health. A little bit of morning sun, late sun's good. If you're going to be out in the sun quite a bit, definitely have a nice 30 SPF zinc base sunscreen that's really low chemical on there out of the gates. All right, so lab testing. If you have skin issues, right? Females have to look for high levels of free or total insulin. PCOS is a big risk factor that can drive up insulin in women. Second thing is high levels of insulin. So get your fasting insulin looked at, get free and total testosterone, maybe other antigen, maybe getting your DHEA sulfate looked at, even your estrogens, if those are out of whack, that could be a problem, progesterone too. So it's good to do a full hormone panel, but the big ones are insulin, fasting, free total testosterone, DHEA, and your estrogen, really important out of the gate. Guys, same thing, insulin's gonna be important. Still look at your androgens too. Again, androgens with guys, they're gonna cause more sebum production, meaning more oils. And so this is where having a good skincare routine helps. Is the skincare routine the root cause? No, it's not. But it can definitely help, and it can be a very powerful Band-Aid, and it can give you a lot more latitude. So as you get your diet better, 
right? You cut out the sugars, cut out the dairy, cut out the processed food. It can give you a little wiggle room. So if you're off, you're less likely to get super inflamed. Dairy also can be a very insulin stimulator and it can create a little more oil production. Um, mentioned dairy, mentioned the grains, the processed flours, anything inflammatory, anything that's gonna feed that dysbiotic bacteria. Antibiotics can really throw off the microbiome too, so those are all big things. Get a high quality gut test, whether it's an organic acid test to look at fungal overgrowth, bacterial, C. diff, a good quality stool test. I mean, really important to look at the bacterial imbalances, gut inflammation, also that Pillsbury Stokes review said what? 40% have low stomach acid. So we gotta get stomach acid and enzyme levels looked at internally. We gotta get the bacterial imbalances looked at. Uh, inflammation, you could run a, a stool-based zonulin to see what's going on. A blood-based zonulin may be better to look at gut permeability, but I, I assume it's there if we have this kind of inflammation present because it's about 40 to 50% of people have this gut permeability. So I assume it's there because it doesn't change my treatments specifically. I look at the underlying factors that I mentioned bacterial-wise upstream, and then leaky gut's kind of a downstream effect. So we go to the roots, you fix the root, the downstream impacts are, are mediated, if you will. Okay, so lab testing, we talked about that, and then the skin stuff. We talked about um, you know the high-quality unscented sulfur soap. I'll put a link down below. Again, lab tests that I use, it will be kind of specific based on patients. So if you want more support and you want to get your skin health, your microbiome dialed in, want to go to the next level, there'll be a link where you can reach out to my staff and team. We're happy to help you out. We see patients worldwide. If you want more support on the skin and getting to the root cause, there'll be links down below. For some of the products that I'm mentioning, I'll put links down below for the different products that I'm specifically using and recommending with patients. They may change over time, so we'll keep those links um, down below updated and we'll, we'll tag a... Um, pin a post down there as well. All right, guys, any more questions, any more support, feel free and let me know. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, let me know how you benefited and please feel free and share with family and friends. All right, guys, take care. Have a good night.